Hello everyone, happy Tuesday. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Audrey Stewart and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am very excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Michelle Bowdler discussing her debut book, Is Rape a Crime? A Memoir, an Investigation, and a Manifesto. She is joined tonight in conversation by Alex marzano Lesnovich. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors to our community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on our Zoom page and as always, our event schedule appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk, go to the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you would like to buy a copy of Is Rape a Crime, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in in support of our authors and incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Now, I'm really honored to introduce tonight's speakers. Michelle Bowdler is the Executive Director of Health and Wellness at Tufts University. She has been an advocate for social justice surrounding the violence of rape for over a decade. Michelle's work has been featured in the New York Times and multiple anthologies. Her essays have been twice nominated for the Pushcart Prize. She is a recipient of the 2017 Barbara Deming Memorial Award for Nonfiction and has been a fellow at Ragdale and McDowell Colony. She is joined tonight by Alex marzano Lesnovich. They are the author of the multi-award winning memoir, The Fact of a Body. They are the recipients of the fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, McDowell, Yaddow, and more. Their work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and plenty of others. Tonight, they are discussing Michelle's book, Is Rape a Crime? This book takes a hard look at how our country has addressed sexual violence. Every 73 seconds, someone is sexually assaulted in the United States. Fewer than 3% of rapists ever spend a night in jail. Rape in this country is not treated as a violent crime, despite it being so. We need the story Michelle has given us, and equally as important, we need people like you at home to hear the story, to support the story. So thank you again, Michelle, for speaking and for you at home for listening. Its importance cannot be overstated. And with that, Alex, Michelle, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you again both for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to ask Alex to just um, introduce our night, and then I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction of the book. Thank you, Michelle. And I've got to say, as I, as I imagine many of you in the audience might know, because um, some of you might be a part of our wonderful Boston community, um, I first met Michelle when she was a student in the Memoir Incubator, um, one of Grub Street's programs, um, where I had the extraordinary pleasure, really the life-changing pleasure, of reading a first draft of this book. Um, so it would be fair to say that I have been waiting many years for tonight, as I'm sure many of you have been waiting many years for tonight, and we are so happy to be here to support Michelle on the launch of this extraordinary book. Um, it is gorgeous, it is searing, it is urgent, it will make you think and it will change the way you think. And I would absolutely urge you to get yourself a copy in the link that is now, right now, in the chat box, um, if you haven't already had a copy. So the way tonight's going to work is Michelle's going to read um, to you a bit from the book, so you can get a, a sense of some of the voice um, that Michelle writes with, which is so searing and beautiful. Um, and also a sense of what the book is about. And then Michelle and I are going to have um, the conversation. I have quite a number of questions for Michelle. Literally, again, been waiting years for this conversation. <laughs> so 
<laughs> we'll see how many we can get through. Um, but around uh, 7.45, I'll start seeing if you all have any questions because I think Michelle would really love to hear from you. Please put those questions in the Q&A and I will read them aloud to Michelle. All right, so Michelle, please take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Alex. That was so generous of you. And thank you all for spending time with us. And I want to start by thanking Harvard Books. And uh, also I'm gonna thank Grub Street for all they've provided uh, and for the instruction uh, provided by Alex, who I'm so honored to have joined me tonight. And, um, and just thank you to all my friends and family and perhaps people I don't know who took the time to, to come in today. So I'm going to read the introduction because it is uh, not so much part of the memoir, but I do think it sets the stage of what this book is going to be. And I'm just gonna stop at some point. I think I'm gonna read about somewhere between five and eight minutes and then really wanna have time to talk to Alex. So I'm gonna start. And so just forgive me for looking down, but I do not have this memorized. Although I've certainly worked it over several times. Okay. Is rape a crime? It's a startling question. Most people would answer emphatically, of course it is. They might even add, what kind of a question is that? This question though is a fair one to explore given how rape is treated in our country and around the world, under investigated, trivialized and excused. Is anything else enacted as an international weapon of war and referred to for a sure laugh at a comedy club? Rape in the United States is a felony in theory, but ev evidence of rape is largely ignored and victims are expected to prove their veracity. This reluctance from law enforcement to use its valuable resources does not seem to extend to other felonies. The kind where evidence is, is tested and witnesses interviewed, the kind DAs prosecute readily, the kind where arrest and conviction are more than a remote possibility. We are left with a central contradiction here. Most people when asked will agree that rape is one of the most horrific violations that can happen to a human being. Yet somehow society appears to stand aside while crimes of rape are minimized or dismissed if they are reported at all, if they're investigated at all. The crime of rape sizzles like a lightning strike it pounces, flattens, and devastates its victims. A person stands whole, and in a moment of unexpected violence, that life, that body, is gone. If the eviscerated individual somehow rises, incredulous bystanders shout with relief, they're alive, they're a survivor, not realizing the victim's organs are incinerated, her brain running scrambled egg. And what of those internal scars? Does time alone allow regeneration? Can medical care fully repair the bodily damage the lightning bolt so violently imprinted? Since the injuries are largely unseen by others, how does the victim carry on? How are the scars attended to and softened rather than made hard and immovable? To answer those questions, to really answer them and not turn away, we need to consider the role we play in dismissing the experiences of victims of sexual violence. This collusion by omission occurs in large measure to protect our own vulnerability. The challenge of confronting a power structure so entrenched that its full impact is unseen lies in the insidiousness, insidiousness of our need to look away. What we accept as a normal response to sexual violence is anything but. We must make space for each individual story, creating a larger mosaic of what has emerged as an all too common experience the delegitimization of rape as a crime. Only then can we begin to change how rape is addressed in our society. This is a difficult task I ask of you, to look at these violent crimes full on and listen as I tell my story and what it implies about a collective disregard for victims of sex crimes. But I hope you will listen and I hope you will consider engaging in a shared and urgent task to both recognize and raise awareness about the many ways rape is treated differently from all other felonies and to demand change. Our collective efforts are needed in this essential task and the work cannot be done in isolation. The term rape culture was introduced by second wave feminists in the mid 1970s to describe how pervasive and normative violence against women in the United States was. 20 years later, the problem identified by the term not solved through naming it 
the editors of Transforming a Rape Culture describe it, described it as a complex set of beliefs that encourage male, encourages male aggression and supports violence against women. It condones physical and emotional terrorism against women and presents as the norm that sexual violence is a fact of life, inevitable. Today, the Me Too movement and a charged political environment continues to struggle, the struggle to define rape culture, address its impact and affect change. Rape culture is the subject of a number of books, essays and inspiring speeches. What is it we continue to name over 50 years time that is so recalcitrant? It's damage tolerated. Centuries ago, violent sexual crimes committed against women were considered crimes against their husbands, a harming of their property, a stain on their honor. In contexts where rape was perceived as affecting men by proxy, it was often addressed with more gravity than it is now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Even in that short excerpt, you've given us so much to think about. Thank you. Now, Michelle, when I first saw this book years ago, um, it was entirely a memoir uh, without research into these broader issues. Um, and indeed, the first draft, if I recall correctly, began with a poem. Now, as we can hear already, it's a, it's a very different voice. Now it's a memoir and, as your subtitle tells us, and a manifesto and an investigation. When did it change form and why? It actually really changed form over the last year. Uh, once once um, uh, the publisher and I agreed to work together. And really, in conversation, it became clear to both of us, I think, that the story that I was trying to tell of my own individual story really did have a much, a much larger um, group of people who needed representation and needed voice. And so over the last six months to a year, I've done a tremendous amount of research and incorporated and woven that into the memoir. And I'm actually really much happier with it in this form. I think that it really does finally tell the story that I meant to tell. And that story is so beautifully encapsulated in this bold, provocative title that just really asks us this question, is rape a crime? Um, how did you arrive not only at this question that kind of centers our attention um, and is unusual as a title and question form, but yeah. also at something so provocative? And, and, and how has that felt to you to have this out in the world? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I have been asked that. Um, and what I can say and what I want people to know is that I actually never saw it as provocative. I never saw it as a trick. I actually, I was asked that question by a rape survivor um, in an event that we were doing where if you can imagine this, we as a group of survivors were called to Los Angeles and we were going to try to help law enforcement do a better job. They couldn't imagine that they were now going through all these untested rape kits in particular cities. And they were trying to figure out how to knock on people's doors or whether to knock on people's doors and say, hey, uh, 20 years ago, this thing happened to you that no one ever uh, got back to you about. And we actually now tested the evidence and we found uh, who your perpetrator was. And, um, and also they went on to rape six other people and um, you know, thought you might wanna know that and now we have news for you and oh, by the way, it's too late to prosecute. And this woman looked at me and she had had actually a similar experience to that exact kind of situation. And she looked at me as we were getting ready to go to the airport and she said, you know, you really have to ask yourself if rape is a crime. You know, these kids weren't backlogged. There was never an investigation. and that sentence stood out to me for, for years. And I think she had a right to ask that question. And I think that victims and survivors have a right to ask that question, given all the evidence of how rape is addressed in our society, which is not very, not, not very, not very well. So in a way you're asking us to think about, is it really a crime if we don't treat it like a crime? Yeah, I am. 
see it like a crime. Yeah. And, and you know, the, I, I finished reading early because I wanted to have the conversation, but I address right in the beginning that I am actually not a pro-carceral person. I don't believe that, you know, as it is, we are the um, country that has the most uh, imprisoned people in the world. So it's not that I'm advocating for more people to go to jail. What I'm asking for is for the same seriousness that we address other felonies to, to look at how we treat rape and why it's so vastly different. And let's start with, let's start with that as a question and see where we go. Well, that's on my list of questions for you a bit later, but maybe this would be a good moment to ask it. Um, why do you think rape is so minimized in our culture? Well, I think it would be too uh, simple just to say misogyny, but I do, I do feel that there is something, there is something related to the fact that the majority of victims of rape are women, children, gender non-conforming people, LGBTQ people have much higher rates of sexual assault, and that the people who are writing the laws, doing legislation, and meant to hold people accountable for the work that they do in law enforcement often are not, are, are pe people in power are still largely uh, not representative of the population I just mentioned. And I just believe there's a connection there and that we really need to look at making sure that all of those people who've been victimized have, have the voice that they deserve. And I think part of what you're pointing us to is the idea that the people in power may not, having not had the experiences of some of the victims of, of these kinds of violent crime, right. it may not be quite as visceral to them, which is one of the, the really powerful, thing, powerful things your book does, is it makes it visceral, but also makes the connection to the argument. So I want to talk for a second about the structure, because okay. the structure is so much kind of how you pull that off. It's great. Yeah. And I know I am guessing there are a lot of writers in this virtual room. So part one of the book is a memoir in which you focus on your own story. Part two of the book is the investigation, but it's not just an investigation into what happened with your own rape, but as you write, a need to examine why rape is, again, I'm gonna use your word here, minimized. And then part three, of course, is the manifesto which is both a manifesto about what needs to change and what you want to see change, but in its own way, it's also a different kind of memoir, a memoir that takes Michelle, the character, into action and activism. Um, and we sort of watch the character of, of you, the character based on you, Michelle, go yeah. through these three stages in the book um, and arrive to a place of writing this book. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us about that structure. When did you arrive at that structure? Um, you know, and honestly, I've never heard it said quite that way. And I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I often say that I couldn't have written this book one second sooner than I did. And part of it was that I needed to find that voice and I needed to turn that sense of outrage and get it outside of me and onto the page and into activism. And so I think the structure does represent a change that I also uh, went through. Um, I think if you, as you read the book, all three different parts have memoir and pieces of an investigation and pieces of a manifesto. But I did really, it was very important for me to set the stage of the impact, the devastating impact of really unimaginable violence for people who haven't experienced it. And to say, this is not, this is not um, a misunderstanding, this is not a miscommunication, but this is a violent crime that in the majority of cases, people actually believe will end in their death, even when, even when the perpetrator is, is known. That there's no difference between a known or an unknown perpetrator regarding people's feelings that they're about to die. And to really, to really get that established, because I think then when you get to the investigation, you really, you really understand the juxtaposition of the ways in which law enforcement ignores and disregards victims, because you now, you now really see the impact and how it is brutal, 
and lifelong and not something that is just, you know, he said, she said, and what's the big deal? It's over anyway. And so it, and so to lead into the investigation after you've really seen this, this character, me, um, struggle and then feel like life had begun again and then struggle again, I think does set the stage in, a, in hopefully a way that will resonate with a lot of people who've had that experience as well. And then the manifesto is, is like, we, we're, we're just done with this. We're all done with pretending this isn't, that this isn't happening, that it's okay, um, and that it's okay to treat such a huge percentage of people like their experience doesn't matter and doesn't need to be attended to. And I think I say in the manifesto, we can't be celebrating things that are slightly less terrible, like woohoo, spousal rape is illegal. Like that, that's not what we're gonna be satisfied with. We're gonna look at the root cause of why this is happening and work to make change together. That was beautifully said. And I think you're right that the having us go into the emotional weight of the impact really creates a compelling call to action for the rest. But I, I wanna back up a little bit as a writer and just have a little question, um, discussion with you about how you achieve that impact. Um, it's so hard to ask a writer kind of how she does it, um, but still I must. Um, the first time I read the memoir portion of this book, I thought, man, I have never seen anyone write about disassociation so well. Um, you must have gotten tired of me saying to you, I think I said it every other week, that I needed you to finish this book so that I could give it to other writers who were trying to capture that feeling of dissociation. It's something I've tried to write about myself and I can't pull it off the way you pull it off. You really capture that feeling. Um, and I had asked you if you minded, you kindly gave me permission to read just a paragraph that'll lead us into this question. Um, it's at the start of chapter one, it's 1984, and you write, I'm sitting in the back of a police car like someone accused of a crime. It is the first night of summer in Boston. I do not have on handcuffs. I have not been read my rights. I'm a victim, not a prisoner, but the difference between the two has completely escaped me tonight and will for the rest of my life. The way that you capture that kind of flatness of tone that gets out the dissociation feeling of not being in your body, yet still connect it to these poetic musing lines that let us understand kind of what you're going through um, and also connect it later on to um, kind of a splintering of the body that you write about. You write, I'd love to hand my brain over to the officers because then maybe they could know what had happened to you without you saying another word. You write about other parts of your body as though they are disconnected from yourself. Um, the body becomes again that splintered entity and trauma shatters the character in that moment, Chummer Siders, you in that moment. Um, how, how did you write this? How did you do it? It's so good. Thank you. I, um, you know, there are, there are things in this book that were really easy to write and things that were really hard. And I have to really say that the parts about, parts writing about disassociation actually felt like things that just kind of came out of me. I think that I lived with that experience while probably a lot of people would never have guessed it. And, and also I had to figure out, and you know, you did help me with this, I will say, I had to make very intentional choices about what I was gonna put in the book and what I wasn't gonna put in the book. And I wanted to capture that, I wanted to write in detail about some of the things that had happened, but I also felt like what happened and the experience of what happened were equally important. And so when I actually describe the rape, which I remember saying to, do I really have to, like, do I really have to do that? Can't I just be vague? And you said, no, you have to try to do it. And, and I, in the book and in the writing, I remember that I wanted people to have the experience of the disassociation without, and that that would leave people with an impression 
more than the actual details of what physically happened. And so there's a line where I say, how can I describe what happened when I wasn't there? And that, and so it, for some reason, it just was very natural to me. And maybe it was because I had lived with it for so very long. Really, it's really beautifully said that what, what happened in the experience of what happened are both equally important and also equally important to your argument and what you want us to take away from this book, I think, to make change. Um, it brings me to um, a line your, your wife Mary says to you in the book and um, that I've heard you quote many times over the years and I think is so striking. She says, um, you're not crazy. What happened to you is crazy. Could you tell us a little bit about that line and why it becomes so centrally important? So for me, um, and, and then, like when she said that to me, um, you know, when you're somebody who hears a siren and jumps, practically jumps out of their skin, um, or feels impacted in a way that feels this big when you see that other people don't, some other people don't, it's very easy for that person to experience that as a, as, as a shame and blame of themselves that something is wrong with them. And when you, when you are looking from the outside that you are impacted by something that you know, stays, in, stays with you for many, many years, if not forever, that your response is based on something that should never happen to anybody. And, um, and I think that was the core of the meaning when she said that to me. And it, and it really has resonated. And I think about it a lot, which is why I put it in the book, that we all, you know, anybody who's, who blames themselves for their response to an, an unimaginable event um, needs to cut themselves a little bit of a break. And if we could do that, I think that we would find our voices a little bit sooner. And part of that is not feeling like what we went through is invisible to everybody else and is, un is, this, and is unimportant to the people who we come to for some help, like the police. You're right about really this kind of cultural gaslighting. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm going to use that maybe to take us into the investigation part of this book. Um, we, we talked a little bit about why rape is so minimized. Um, but a big way that that shows up in it not being treated like every other violent crime is the infuriating lack of testing of evidence. Mm -hmm. And when you write about the untested rape evidence, um, I, think, I think very powerfully seem to disdain the word backlog. Mm -hmm. And we so often hear the word backlog applied to this evidence. We so often hear the backlog of untested rape kits, right? right. But can you tell us more about why backlog isn't the right word? Yeah. So the same woman who asked me if rape was a crime uh, has a, a piece on YouTube called There Is No Backlog. And, and it's, it, so imagine, imagine these warehouses. Uh, in LA, there were 12,000 untested, untested rape kits. And each of those 12,000 kits represent a person who went through a rape exam and went to the police, or it never would have wound up in a, in a warehouse. And when those were discovered by a human rights, the Human Rights Watch, which began to do the initial investigation into this issue, people would say, the police would say, you know, it's really expensive to, to test a rape kit. It's like $1,500. And, you know, if, if it's not going to go forward, if it's not going to lead to um, a case, that's a lot of money. And so really, we didn't test these kits because, uh, because we didn't have the money and we weren't going to do it unless we, we had the money. And so there has been a big push um, to provide, you know, millions, millions of dollars have gone to police uh, and law enforcement to stop this, um, you know, backlog of kits. And if, and so, and they'll, and they'll even say, well, we'll do it, but we need the money to do it as if the kids got old on their own as if the cases went cold for some inexplicable reason. And there's no accountability 
by the state to say, you're not getting more money to do something you should have done. And look at the results. You're finding out that there were rapists out there who committed multiple crimes that could have been addressed sooner had you just done their job. So there's no, there's no accountability to law enforcement for what they've done in, in, for hundreds of thousands of individual lives who never heard a word about their case. And so I don't think we should call it a backlog. I think we should call it untested and, uninvest and uninvestigated rape cases and ask the question of why. Powerfully, powerfully said. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we will be going to a Q&A. So um, if you've got questions for Michelle, and I know you must, she's giving us so much to think about, um, please type them into the Q&A so that we have them uh, there when it is time. But I want to follow up on, Michelle, what you just mentioned, because if I'm, if I'm remembering this correctly, like you didn't always know that. And you didn't, you know, even the book takes us into the fact that you didn't always know that. Right. Um, you yourself felt very alone in the experience um, at the start. And I wonder if you can tell us what your own process of investigating was like, what your own process of coming to this broader awareness of the size of the social, the huge social problem, social gaslighting, social disaster, and how we treat this. So I, I didn't know why I felt so impacted. And one day, well, I had read one article, it was called The Rapist in the Freezer. And it was, um, and it was about how uh, cold cases were being solved when people actually started testing rape evidence. And I don't know how I came across it. It was just in an online journal that I had read. And then I, one day, 2007, I was reading the Boston Globe and I saw that uh, a review of a scandal at the state crime lab revealed that there had been 16,000 untested DNA samples in the crime lab that went back to 2007. So I thought, I wonder, I wonder if that's why I never heard anything. And I wonder what I could find out by trying to look into this a little bit further. And that process was, was brutal because I read the article the next thing that happened was that the governor and the attorney general said, you know what, that's an exaggeration. Those, those were never meant to be tested or there was no uh, good DNA back in the 1980s, so we didn't bother. And, and really it's probably more like two or 3,000, as if two or 3,000 would be ex an acceptable number. And I went around asking different organizations if they were as outraged as I were and what we could find out and is anybody going to sue anybody and what's going to be the outrage. And I found that most people felt like it was an old issue where it wasn't a real issue or really it was so much better now and the Boston police did a great job and, you know, they're really easy to work with. And I felt like it was my problem still. And then I wound up going to Washington, D.C. I had been, in, by doing this research, I actually spoke to the person who had written the first article about L.A. and the 12,000 rape kits there. And she invited me to go to the Department of Justice. And I wound up meeting about 12 or 13 women who were going, again, to help cities figure out how to tell survivors that they had found all these untested rape kits. And that was when I found out that I wasn't alone, that most of them, unlike me, actually had discovered who their perpetrator was when their city started going through these kits. But I saw the impact that it had on them. I saw how tormented they were of what it was like to get that call. And while they were happy to know the name of this person, they always had the same question. Why did it have to take so long? Why did it have to take so long? Like I could have known sooner. I could have known they were in jail. I could have known that I was safe. I could have known and nobody ever bothered to do anything. And that really, that emboldened me to say, you know, this really isn't okay and I need to keep going and, and that it isn't a backlog and that we need to be thinking about this differently. 
Picking up on that, thinking about it differently, um, I'm struck by the manifesto word in the subtitle. It is a bold word, right? Manifesto is inherently bold. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what the word manifesto means to you and what do you most want to see change and how? So it is, it's a, it's a huge question. And I, and I don't think it has an easy answer, but what I think it starts with is trying to look at the root cause of how we got into the situation in the beginning and to hold people accountable for not doing their jobs. And by that, I mean law enforcement. I think we have to hold them accountable when they decide which felonies are worthy of investigations and which ones aren't. So we need to bring it to the light and we need to say this is not okay. Um, I also feel like when I, when I think about law enforcement, I also think about how for a lot of people, what they're looking for is not, not a conviction, not a, not a courtroom trial, but they're looking for some help or they never would have reported it to the police in the first place. And what you hear is that when people feel heard, they feel listened to and they feel believed and that someone does what they can to help them in this situation. And sometimes it's to investigate their case and take someone dangerous off the street. That alone will reduce the possibility of chronic PTSD as opposed to about a PTSD that comes with <clears throat> a violent assault. And that, is the it, that it is the response of people that you perceive are in a helping role that can often help people deal with their trauma much better. And so I would like to see that as a goal. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see uh, training and training of officers if we're going to continue to have the system where we have to report to police in order to get needed resources. Um, for rape victims like victim compensation, which you can't get often if you don't report. Um, if we're going to keep that system up, which maybe we won't, um, at least to have people trained so that they don't make things worse and they don't add harm to what's already a devastating situation. I want victims to think that what happened to them matters and that we're going to do something about it. Powerfully, powerfully said again. Powerfully yeah. said um, and it leads well, I think, into just to, I'm going to take a minute and talk about silence because you write extremely movingly, not only about the pain of holding silence, but about the harm of it. You say that silence can lead to two kinds of distortions. One, something you just touched on, that it traps the victim of rape in feeling alone when actually close to 20% of people have been through sexual assault or abuse. And two, another kind of distortion that allows people in power who are not making these changes to marginalize people who've been through sexual assault and to create this culture of a lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. um, you have this really beautifully written scene in which you recount telling your story publicly for the first time and you write, quote, I would never be silent about my experience again. Yeah. And when I read that, I couldn't help but imagine the woman you were then watching the woman you are now who is so publicly not silent and is on the day when your book enters the world about this. You wrote a whole book about this transformation, but what can you tell us now about it on the day that your book enters the world? Yeah, well, I know it's kind of, uh, it's kind of intense to hold up this book and say, this is my story. This is my story. And I guess what I would say is that my hope for this book is that it is actually, I believe it's a book about optimism and joy and love and all that's possible. Um, so that you might read this book and you might see its title and you might think that I'm going to forever be um, associated with a devastating crime. And what I would say is that for the people who are watching who've known me for years and who've seen me get to this point, that I'm all the better for being able to own what happened to me and not have it identify me, but have it be integrated into who I am. Because then it can speak to being a part of me 
and not overtaking who I am. And I think that's true for anyone who names their experience and, 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 and says, this is not a unique experience and, um, and people don't need to be as alone as they are. And that there are people out there who, when they're ready, can speak up. Not before they're ready, but when they're ready. And I think that's a really important thing to do if you can. That is beautifully said. And so one last question before we turn to um, the questions in the chat, because there are wonderfully so many of them that we want to get started on. <laughs> Just one last thing. You know, you ask us um, in the introduction to look at these crimes head on and to listen to the people who've been through them. Um, what would you like us to take away? What can, what can we do as we listen to you share your story? I think that listening is very powerful and i think that if i could give any bit of advice or or what i would wish i would wish that people not only held their beliefs and spoke their beliefs but that they took action there's a lot of people right now who are putting their bodies out every day protesting things that they feel are unjust and i have to say that um, if i could beseech people to vote. Um, you know, 30 to 40% of people every year or in every election don't vote in a democracy that is defined now by not who actually gets the most votes, but by an archaic system that um, it's, it's pretty easy to figure out how to work. And so I'm asking people if they want change and they believe that there is injustice in the world to think about the people that they want to represent them and vote. That would be, well, thank you. We're all waiting for the chance to do it. Yes. <laughs> yes, um, yes, we are. Thank you so very much you. for your really extraordinary thoughts and sharing them with us and this beautiful book you've written. Um, you. I want to read to you some questions that have come up in the chat. Um, so for a little bit of context for this one, um, your wife, Mary, and your two children become big characters in this book. In fact, I believe you and your daughter, Becca, just did an Instagram Live we did. earlier today, right? Yeah, we um, did. And we have a question from Sandy Block. How old were your kids when you first told them about the rape? So I think they were maybe 11 and 13. Um, I think my son, um, my son found out, I think in the book, I say that he read, accidentally read something that I had been working on. And before he could even realize what it was, he found out what happened. And he, he told Mary and didn't really want to talk about it, but knew. And sort of the invitation was there, but, um, you know, it wasn't a secret. And then we told Becca when um, she, I think, had just started middle school, so maybe she was even younger, I think maybe seventh or eighth grade. But I was going to the Department of Justice, and my friends would come over, and we'd be chatting about how nervous I was, and I didn't want her to accidentally overhear. And so, um, you know, now it's a part of our, our life and our story, and I was really proud to sit with Becca today. I really felt like um, that said something about also who she is. She's also an activist and cares very much about um, uh, our world and its need to change. And it really felt like an honor to have her ask me questions. I was really, really thrilled to do that. That is, that is so wonderful and powerful. Um, this question comes from Karen Kirsty, And for everyone whose name I'm reading off, if I butcher your name, I'm very sorry. Um, if you had to choose two people you wanted to read this book to affect change, who would they be and why? Wow, that's a great question. Um, well, I guess, I, so if I had to name two people, I think I would, I would uh, name uh, a, a police, I'm gonna be a little vague and say, you know, police captains everywhere who are running uh, special victims units and, uh, and, um, and also, I guess I would say people who run nonprofits, who are, and so again, I'm saying categories as opposed to individuals, but people who run nonprofits who are uh, responding to victims and, um, and who often, um, 
you know, some of, some of them, I think, have had experiences themselves and they are very, very committed to the work that they do. But I think understanding how victims uh, experience law enforcement's response and legislators' response is really critical. And so I, I, would, like, I would like to be able to hand it to them as well. Wonderful. Um, the next question comes from Hannah Kent and I think is a question that um, will be relevant for many of us and it's a great one. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to prepare to read your story if someone has experienced an assault themselves? Right, I think that's a great question. And so what I would say is that uh, you can skip parts or you can wait until you're ready or you can, you can talk to people who you love and who you've trusted with this information to figure out together whether you're ready to read it and to give yourself permission to take the time that you need. Like I said, this book took me a long time to write and it's okay if it takes people a long time to read. It can sit on their shelves and it's really okay. I'm actually going to go a bit further down the queue. We'll come back up to the question before, but since it links up, um, where in your journey, in your, um, this question comes from Sharon Weber, um, where in your recovery journey did you know that you needed to write a book about this? Uh, was it a moment of inspiration or a specific event or a number of events over time? Right. So actually it was kind of, it, I, I wouldn't have known it was intentional at the time. You know, for those of you who have only known me in the work that I do at Tufts, I mean, I, had, well, you'll see when you read the book, but I, I really had planned a life. Uh, I was an English major and I loved writing. I had planned to pursue that to a certain extent. And after the rape, I think I just put down my pen for probably 20 years, if not more. And I picked it up again right before the memoir incubator, Alex, when I wanted to see whether I could begin to understand what had happened through the lens of a creative process. So I started to write, and I also started to write stories about some people in my family. I have, you know, some really, in, like, you know, my grandmothers, and and um, and it was sort of trying to figure out where I had learned resilience and why I had survived, and and then I took this class, which I was really lucky to get into, given that I had, was really a novice in many, many ways. And, and I got ready and I got a little more ready. I mean, that's why, I mean, our class ended four years ago or three and a half years ago um, in May of 2017. So it's a little over three years. And I think that um, I got ready as I wrote it. And I remember the very first day we sat in your class and the first thing we had to do was go around and say the topic of our project. And I remember all of us gulping because we all, we all had something we had to say that maybe we hadn't ever said aloud. And so from the very first moment in that class, there had to be some safety. And, you know, you provided a an atmosphere of trust and safety that could allow us to do that. And I, um, and I think that really helped make it possible. And, and so that, that's how, yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm going to ask one more question that talks about the same emotional trajectory before we move back into the rest of the queue. This one's from um, Roseanne Tung, uh, who writes, thank you for sharing. Uh, could you please talk about how you might have grown or healed during the process of writing the book, and especially how you might have changed from before to after your research for part three this past year? I'll tell you, this has been quite a year. Um, it has been quite a year going through the Boston Globe archives and my memories and trying to integrate all that I, all the articles that I read and all of my own memories into what's now a book. And so I think, I think that it was really this year and the, and, and in the process of editing and editing and re-editing and really, I, I, I just, I feel like I had the best editor in the world and, and, and I, who I trusted with the material. 
And so when you read something again and again and again, and you move it here and you move it there and you try to figure out the structure, um, it becomes a story. It becomes a little bit more of a story. It becomes, it becomes, it's something that's outside of you that you can see, that you can read, and also that has a context, that the research really provided a context that really confirmed and validated a lot of what I, of what I believed. And so that was also something that really changed in the course of this year. And I think, um, you know, has helped me finish. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, Ellen Brodsky writes, um, have you noticed any positive cultural shifts on how people understand rape now as compared to 30 years ago? And why have those shifts happened if so? And what might more might we do to continue to um, catalyze positive cultural shifts? Right. So I would say yes and no. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to feel like we have this me too moment that people are calling it like it's a moment like it's not going to last and that as like i say in the book as soon as a few people are held accountable the very next thing that happens is we've gone too far now it's a it's a witch hunt it's um it's to get back at people it's not a safe time for men in our society blah 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 and so i think that i i do believe a, i believe in our you know, in Becca's generation and in, you know, the, the sense of, of, of um, the need to demand social change is feels more urgent than ever now. Um, and so I do believe that that is important, but I also believe that a fundamental shift has not yet occurred. I do think more representation in all areas of government matter but uh, nonetheless, when you look at our, when our, when you look at our judicial system, when you look at our politicians, it's still overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly white, and that needs to change through more representation. I think that that will that will help lead to a shift as well. And that brings us back to your point about voting. Yeah, critically <laughs> important. Um, the next question comes from Sandy Block. Um, if Police uh, departments received millions of dollars for testing rape kits and the kits weren't tested. How was that money spent and were they accountable for the misuse? Well, they, once they got the money, they did test them because they said, well, we have this backlog and it's not our fault and it's nothing we did. It just happened. We just happened to have 8,000 kits in a warehouse over here, but my goodness, we can't possibly do it now. We have present day things to worry about, even though it's unclear whether in present day they were doing it either. So there's been legislation that's passed that all kits will be tested, but it's, it's tricky because what they mean is some states mean all kits, some states mean if the DA thinks it's worthy of a prosecution. So you have to watch it when people are talking about how legislation will improve things. Um, so. Anyway, I don't know if I, I, got, I lost track of the end of the question there, but I hope I answered it. I think you answered the spirit of it. And um, I'll actually follow up with a question from Dolores Johnson that pertains to the same issue. Yes, another yes. <laughs> question from AQVs, which is so fabulous to see their names. Um, what is the BPS status today relative to testing rape kits and taking cases to court? What is the, for the Boston police? Yeah. Um, you know, I, so Massachusetts has recently signed a bunch of legislation. So we'll put the, B, the Boston Police Department aside for a second. They've signed, and I was actually part of a, a group that was looking at this multi-million dollar software that's gonna track your rape kit. It's gonna track it for you. And you can log in and you can find out where it is in the process. But that doesn't mean that more people are comfortable reporting. It doesn't mean that more people feel comfortable going to the police. And it doesn't mean that the, B the Boston Police Department um, still doesn't have the same pressure that law enforcement has everywhere, which is if you don't believe a crime can be, that not that it can be solved or investigated, but that you can win the case in court. That's how they're judged. That's how DAs are judged is their win rate. 
And so if you continue to believe that the cases aren't going to go forward, I think it's really hard to, to move cases along. So do I think the Boston Police Department is doing a better job than it did 30 years ago? I do. I won't say that I think that they're, but I also think there continue to be systemic problems that have not been addressed and need to be addressed. Powerfully said. Um, a question from another incubator that follows up on that, uh, Molly Howes. Um, going forward, do you recommend that people who are raped should report their assaults to the authorities? Uh, I think that is a very, very challenging question that every individual who's experienced rape and sexual assault has to figure out. And I think it's really challenging because over 30% of victims are, you know, trigger warning here, but are, are under the age of, you know, 16. And so, like I say in the book, if your perpetrator is somebody that you rely on to put food on the table, or is a teacher or somebody who is respected in the community, it makes it really, really complicated. And also, if you're somebody who has really good reason to be afraid of the police because of your identity or your race or your gender, um, I don't know that I would recommend it. And I think that it's up to law enforcement to show us that they are a welcoming, trained, and trauma-informed group of people who, when you come to them, will do their best to listen and address your concern. And until that happens, I, I don't feel like I can endorse um, that reporting is what's important. I think that it's only a piece of where change needs to happen. Um, we are going to pivot a little bit um, and talk about sort of you and how you, how you wrote this book. So we got this question from another NQB, Gita Brown. Um, can we talk about how you personally handled the emotional intensity of writing this book while working full time and raising a family? And she notes uh, that she imagines that your answer will inspire other writers and aspiring writers. And I should say to everyone, I am sorry for the sake of brevity, I am skipping all your congratulations note to Michelle, <laughs> but I hope that every, Michelle feels everyone's strong congratulations and joy. And I think I'll be able to see that later. They're recording that. So I assure you, I will see it. And thank you so much. Um, well, I waited to join the memoir incubator and, uh, at Grub Street until my kids were both in college. I felt like I could put, and, and that was fine. I don't, I don't regret that at all. Um, but I felt like the time it would take to spend weekends reading and writing and being in class um, for an entire evening once a week uh, was a lot, it was a lot to ask my family. And Mary was incredibly supportive. And, you know, I wrote in the, I wrote in the evenings, I wrote on weekends and, um, and I took my time. I took my time. I, I also, you know, had vacations and evenings that I, I actually looked forward to it. I felt like I was learning so much. It was kind of a thrill to be writing again and to be thinking about words and um, in a particular way. I, I was, I was, I was teasing someone I did a podcast with, but it was the truth that, you know, four years ago, I didn't know what a narrative arc was. And I didn't, I, there were books that, you know, Alex gave us to read that I had never, I had never heard of that I had just missed. And so, it, you know, it used my, it used my brain in a, in a way that was, was wonderful. And so it was something I really enjoyed. And I felt like I was coming back to a part of me. And so I didn't actually perceive it as a burden. I mean, it was, this year has been exhausting, um, just getting all of this done, but I'm okay. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's been fantastic. It's been really good for me and it's been great for my family, I think. If they were here, if they were gonna write in the chat, they can tell you, but I think they also see how uh, empowering it's been for me and how elevating. Um, and there's a question that, oh. <laughs> I just think we have time for about one more. I, I wish we had time for more. There are so many questions waiting, but we are 
running well on time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's choose this one. Um, this is from Amy Salamone. Michelle, what would you say to women in the United States, a country whose president has been outwardly vicious and hostile towards women? How do we live in this country and support each other and fight back against this hostile culture? Yeah, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. It's pretty tough to know that you can Google horrible things Donald Trump has said about women and there's like hundreds of thousands of hits and and also stupid things politicians have said about rape and find many, many articles that are shocking. And I think that we have to look towards each other and to people who do want to make change. And remember, you know, we just lost probably one of the greatest heroes in our country, um, John Lewis. And really, you know, he talks about good trouble and he talks about, and you know, he was somebody who also never lost his optimism. And people talk about him being somebody who never gave up and always could be decent to people, even if he considered them really, really problematic because he knew what his goal was. And he knew that he wasn't gonna achieve his goal in his lifetime, but he was gonna work up until the day he died. And unfortunately, I think that we're in this for a long haul and that we have to turn to the people that we trust and also who share our values because this work is hard. And I'm not comparing, I'm not comparing this work to the work that he did, but I am saying he's an inspiration for a lot of us. And I, I just wanted to mention that. That is wonderful. Um, Audrey, we, can we get one more in because this has come up from a couple people. Oh, yeah. that, is that all right? Oh couple yeah. I wanna know, Michelle, what is next for you? Well, I, I do want to continue to write. I am, you know, still very committed to the work that I do. And I want to be able to find a way to do both. I want to be able to, and I, and I also think that this book, I hope if it does what I want it to do, that I'll be able to talk to more people about this work and maybe you know, be somebody who can train uh, in, in law enforcement and, you know, continue to do the activism that this book hopefully will be a launch pad for and continue to write and continue to do essays about this topic and others. And, you know, we'll see where it takes me. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you so, so much. And thank you to Harvard Bookstore for having us here to celebrate you. Um, everyone, I really just want to urge you again to buy this book and read it and pass it on to people. This has, I think you're hearing tonight how much this book has the power to make change and it's change that we just so desperately need. So please do your best to help get it out into the world. Thank you so okay. much, Michelle. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Harvard Books. Thank you. Really, Alex, I just, I'm so excited to share this night with you. And um, thank you to all my friends and family and, and writers and readers who are here today and to Audrey. Thank you, Audrey. And, um, and to Flatiron for giving me this wonderful opportunity and the best team I could possibly have imagined. And also I wanna thank my agent, Nikki Richardson, who was really, a, really wonderful. So thank you. Thank you for being, sharing this day with me. Thank you again, both of you. Michelle, thank you, not just for being here, but for writing this book. I, we need it. We really, really need it. Um, Alex, thank you for moderating. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I really feel honored to have been able to work with you both tonight. And thank you to everyone at home who's tuning in, showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our staff here at Harvard Bookstore. If you'd like to support Michelle, there's links to purchase the book in the chat. If for some reason your chat's not working, go to harvard.com. You can purchase the book there. Is Rape a Crime? We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. I hope everyone has a fantastic night. Michelle, Alex, thank you again for being here. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.